Thank you. A very warm welcome everyone to this webinar, the African Continental Free Trade Area, a catalyst for women's economic empowerment. My name is Trudy Hartzenberg and I'm the Executive Director of the Trade Law Center Trulloch and it's my pleasure to welcome you this afternoon on behalf of Trulloch, the AFCFTA Secretariat and IDRC. We want to thank IDRC very much for their support. Trelec is embarking on a project focusing specifically on women in the AFCFDA. Women's economic empowerment, colleagues, is a matter of economic and social justice. It is equally a fundamental economic imperative. If women are left behind, our economies and societies cannot and will not prosper. The AFCFDA presents a singular opportunity for us to shape a pathway to inclusive, sustainable growth and development for Africa through trade and integration. We recognize that the AFCFDA is, of course, a very ambitious initiative. Integrating such a large number of unequal partners, unequal in terms of economic size, economic structure, and levels of development, is indeed a challenge. However, we believe certainly at Trelec that integration and trade liberalization amongst ourselves on the continent are absolutely essential to address the economic constraints we face as small economies, small markets, and very often with the additional challenges that come with, for example, being landlocked. We find ourselves in a rather difficult circumstances right now. We know that the COVID-19 pandemic has in fact exacerbated gender inequality and exclusion. The war in Ukraine reminds us how integrated we all are as we face on the continent challenges in terms of access to grains for basic food security. This contextualization of our collective initiative, the AFCFDA, underscores that we can only achieve its objectives, both the specific ones, such as boosting intra-Africa trade, but also the broader development objectives if women are actively involved in the design, the negotiation, and the implementation of the AFCFDA. The AFCFDA has to work for women and without women, the AFCFDA will not work. We have a distinguished panel for our discussion today. They will lead us in the discussion, but we're counting on your active participation. I will introduce our panelists as they speak. And it's now my great pleasure to welcome a very good friend, Dr. Halima Noor, who's a senior expert on trade and goods at the AFCFDA Secretariat to deliver our opening remarks. Halima, a very warm welcome to you. Uh, thank you very much, Trudy. Uh, a pleasure to see, see you. Hopefully we'll meet soon, inshallah, uh, in person. I'd like to thank Tralak, IDRC, and other colleagues for being here. We appreciate your being here, uh, shows your commitment. It's a Friday afternoon. It shows to all of, for all of us, women issues are at the core of our work and livelihoods, et cetera, is a passion. So on behalf of the, His Excellency, the Secretary General of the FCFTA, Mr. Wamkele Kabetswemene at the FCFTA Secretariat, I would like to express our appreciation that you are all here to engage and share perspectives on a matter which is pivotal to the achievements of the goals and aspirations of the African continent that is economic empowerment of African women. His Excellency, the Secretary General is a champion of women and youth empowerment. And those of you who have listened to him, he's always stressing this point that uh, we are committed to working with our partners, uh, working with them tirelessly in collaboration with women, youth and key stakeholders to ensure that the FCFTA delivers its promise to improve the lives of Africans through inclusive trade. We are happy that uh, 
FCFTA, uh, working with our partners, strategic partners such as Afrexim, et cetera, have designed programs to assist women and that this uh, inclusiveness is pivotal to Africa's development agenda. Indeed, aspiration six of agenda 2063 of the African Union seeks to create an Africa whose development is people driven, relying on the potential of African people, especially its women and youth. One of the goals under aspiration six is to strengthen the role of African women through gender equality and parity in all spheres of life, full gender equality in all spheres. And that's actually something we are looking forward to. If you look, for example, at the FCFTA agreement or protocol in trade in goods, the objective of this protocol, for example, is to create a liberalized market for trade in goods. And also the specific objective is to boost intra-Africa trade which Trudy uh, mentioned that boosting intra-Africa trade would uplift women out of poverty. And we all know that once women uh, have money in their pockets, the whole family and communities thrive. This, this will be through progressive elimination of tariffs, non-tariff barriers, enhanced efficiency of customs procedure, for trade facilitation and transit, and development and promotion of regional and continental value chains and enhanced socioeconomic development, diversification and industrialization of Africa. So basically, there are a number of flexibilities. Uh, we don't have time, but uh, as Trudy mentioned, that uh, this is the first of a number of engagements that we would come back and talk about these flexibilities and how uh, NGOs that are here and partners that are here can create uh, action plans that would assist women take advantage of this. So basically, I would just give you an update on market access. I haven't done that in my uh, presentation. Currently, there are 45 tariff offers. We have 29 ready to start trading. Today, we had a meeting with East African community, uh, the six. So they are ready actually once they update minor issues. So we are happy about that. So we have 35 members. We are having a meeting with Angola next week. So hopefully it will be 36. As you can see, the momentum has not uh, slowed. We are all uh, moving very fast and we are happy about that. In the rules of origin, 87.8 has been agreed. There are currently issues that are outstanding, uh, especially for example, textile which is of interest to women. Uh, we are aware that uh, women are employed uh, heavily in this sector. So hopefully there are rules that will be designed that will protect women. Though it is a double-edged sword, we want to export, but we also want to protect women to take advantage of this. So basically at the FCFTA Secretariat, we are calling for all of us to join hands to make sure that um, the FCFTA succeeds FCFTA issues are complex and sensitive. Many states are at different levels of economic development, and we must all agree, uh, consensus, NGOs and others have a role to play to make sure that me their stakeholders uh, are aware of the FCFTA issues. They must also make sure that uh, domestic follow-up action and reforms within state parties is done, but done through gender sensitive lens, and we must have comprehensive plans to make sure in implementing this that is done through gender sensitive lens. And as you are aware, and Marie will talk about this, uh, there's a, we are working on a protocol on trade on women and youth to alleviate poverty. So this is actually in the right direction and where our UN, uh, UN and NGOs and other partners can come in. So let me thank you uh, very much. And we must ensure that uh, gender issues are mainstreamed uh, and FCFTA issues are main, mainstream, streamed into national development processes. And we all work on action plans to ensure women benefit. Thank you very much. Over to you, Trudy. Thank you so much, Halima, for those opening marks and the reminder of what we have achieved, but what still needs to be done, particularly to finalize the negotiations and to make sure that women's issues are on that agenda. 
I'd like to turn to our panelists now, and I'm just checking if Demita has been able to join us. Um, I know she joined and then she, she disconnected. Demita, are you available? Yes, I am, Shodi. I can surely hear you. Yes, I'm Welcome. Here. It's Thank a great you. pleasure to welcome you. Colleagues, Demita Giang is Head of Customs Cooperation, Trade Facilitation and Transit at the AFCFTA Secretariat, and she will address these issues in the context of the broader discussion of women's economic empowerment. Thank you so much, Demita. The floor is yours. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Trudy, and uh, let me use the opportunity to thank uh, Tralac, IDRC, and my colleagues that are here uh, from AFCFTA. Uh, let me thank Halima, and uh, of course thank uh, Maria that uh, put us all uh, together from this side. Um, uh, I would address the topic from the point of uh, what I handle for the AFCFTA which is uh, trade facilitation, transit, and uh, customs cooperation. Uh, these three annexes in the AFCFTA is the arm of the AFCFTA that would actually ensure that the benefits of uh, the AFCFTA is, is achieved, right? With uh, experience, because uh, uh, like somebody pointed out uh, in some other conversation, uh, it is not enough to remove tariffs. If the goods can't move seamlessly from point A to point B, where they would enjoy the preferences, nothing would have been achieved. And so uh, from the trade facilitation, transit and customs uh, cooperation uh, 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 aspect of uh, the trade agreement, uh, we are to ensure that uh, member states actually live up to their commitments within these annexes. Because what you have in the annexes are commitments taken by member states to say, we are going to do this in this way. It's rules-based. So for instance, within the trade facilitation annex, member states would have committed to, to facilitate, for instance, the, uh, the establishment of single windows, one-stop border posts, to publish their documents for transparency purposes, to ensure that uh, they, 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 they use the least trade restrictive method to process these goods so that they can declare it. And so, um, so what we are trying to achieve in this implementation leg is to work with various customs administrations and various border agencies, because it's not just customs when it comes to trade facilitation. You have other agencies that have a role to play in the clearance of goods. So we are to work with them because like I mentioned, it's actually the state parties that have taken this commitment. But for the secretary, we are to facilitate, we are to, 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 to uh, uh, administer the agreement you know, via the, 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 the state parties and the, the member states. And so from this side, looking at it, what we've decided to do is to give it a corridor approach so that we can address trade facilitation issues from point of origin to point of destination. Because if we don't take this corridor approach, uh, you can do interventions in one particular country but if the next country where the goods are going to pass through, or if the next country where the goods are destined to are not also in line with what you have done, you wouldn't have achieved much. So we have taken a corridor approach uh, to trade facilitation. So we've identified uh, strategic uh, trade corridors within the continent, and we want to tackle issues of trade facilitation from one end. Uh, to the other. Now, let me bring it to the topic at hand. How does this, how would women necessarily, how do we factor in women cross-border traders into this uh, strategy? Now, we have about three buckets of interventions that we have identified. For instance, there are things around infrastructure. There are things around systems. And then you have the people aspect of it. And somewhere in between, in, in, in these buckets that we have identified of things that need to be done, uh, we are going to be doing a continental simplified trade regime. And that is 
with women in, in, in focus because the simplified trade regimes we have at the rec level, I don't think was done with uh, uh, a gender bias. It is just a simplified trade regime that addresses more cross-border traders, but it doesn't have a gender bias. And what we want to do at the continental level is to develop a continental sim sim simplified trade regime that will have a gender bias. We want to, for instance, raise the threshold uh, under which you can trade uh, without uh, the, the cumbersomeness of uh, the documents you need uh, for trade. And so we want to, uh, we are explore, uh, 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 exploiting the, 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 the aspect of uh, the threshold that if we can raise it from $2,000, for instance, that is what is in uh, EAC to $5,000. But to give it a gender bias, what we are looking at is developing a, sim a, a, a this simplified trade regime in a way that the focus will be on goods that are of interest to women, on products that women easily trade. So if we factor this in, and if we factor in a threshold, so, so within the threshold, uh, it would have to be staggered. If we factor it in, in the threshold, we are de uh, developing in, in a staggered way, in a way that it will have a bias uh, uh, towards women. Uh, uh, we would have been able to mainstream women into, into this uh, uh, cross-border trade as it relates uh, to AFCFT. But beyond that, I mentioned the infrastructure. We took an assessment of a field assessment of the Abidjan Lagos corridor. It was really quite touching to discover that most of the border crossings don't have any sanitary facilities. And if you think about this uh, kind of situation, you, would, you, you see the kind of impact it will have on women uh, cross border traders. To have to wait at these border posts and not have a decent, the decency that we should at, at least afford these women on uh, uh, taking care of uh, 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 themselves. And so uh, uh, we have identified this as part of the interventions uh, that uh, uh, would have to happen across uh, the border post. Uh, we're starting with the Abidjan Lagos uh, corridor. So we would be uh, identifying uh, where it is most uh, uh, needed. We are also trying to explore a situation where we have, um, a digital connectivity, but digital connectivity in a way that women can actually be part of this. A simplified uh, system where women can use to process uh, uh, their data issues when it comes to uh, 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 digital, when it comes to cross-border uh, trade. And we're also looking at uh, uh, making sure that uh, these uh, trade rules, the rights and obligations of uh, those who are trading across uh, uh, borders is captured in a way that it is it addresses literacy issues. It's captured in a language that uh, women who uh, cross uh, uh, borders in, uh, in terms of uh, international trade, cross border trade, will be able to know what their rights and obligations are. Will know what the rules say. Will know what. Uh, 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 is available uh, uh, for them, for instance. We are also exploring, we have spoken about this to some uh, uh, border agencies. We are also exploring a situation where you could, they could create a fast uh, track lane for women cross-border traders. And we, are also, we also spoke to uh, border, border crossings uh, agencies uh, about, having, about, about having information, information desks where uh, if there are any issues, these women can easily approach and uh, get issues cleared. But also along that line, we're also thinking about having a, a, gender, a gender desk, not just the information desk, but a gender desk where any issue that is now gender related in terms of women trying to uh, do their normal business across uh, the borders, issues that they face, a gender desk where these issues uh, uh, can be uh, addressed. So in, uh, when we did the uh, uh, field assessment along the Abidjan Lagos Corridor, these were the things that came up. And so these, were, these are the things that we are trying to work into a package uh, in, in terms of uh, those who would partner with uh, to, to, to implement uh, these uh, identified uh, interventions to, to, to enhance uh, uh, the, the movement of goods and then the movement of people across these borders uh, in uh, a seamless uh, 
uh, way. Uh, so uh, uh, in, uh, in summary, in summary, we are trying to ensure that the implementation of the three annexes I mentioned have a, a bias towards uh, uh, women uh, so that uh, we can uh, mainstream uh, gender into, into these uh, uh, trade uh, agreements and its uh, implementation. Uh, thank you very much, Trudy. Thank you so much, Demita. I'm really impressed with the practical detail that is going into the design of a trade facilitation, transport, customs and border management facility and regime, focusing very much on the specific needs of women. So making the simplified trade regime gender responsive. I think this is so important to address the very practical issues that women traders in particular, small scale cross border traders face um, on the continent. Before we move to our next presenter, could I ask our panelists when they speak to activate their cameras? It'd be really nice to see you when you make your presentation. We're also going to have a number of polls during the webinar and Gita will be activating the first one. Um, Halima, as I invite you to make your presentation, you should be able to share your screen. If you don't manage, I'm happy to do that for you. But it's now my great pleasure to invite you back to talk to us about the trade and goods agenda, but also give us further updates on the other aspects of those negotiations. So please do go ahead. Thank you so much, Halima. Over to uh, you. Thank you so much, Trudy. Thank you, Demita. Um, good afternoon once again. Uh, I'm happy to share the update. So could we go to the next slide, please? Marie, I think Marie is, yeah. So basically I thought I would set out the context. There's explicit reference to gender in the, uh, sorry, I think this poll keeps on. So basically you have in article 3E in the gender objectives of the protocol on trading goods that talks about promoting and uh, promote and attain sustainable and inclusive development, gender equality and structural transformation of the state parties. So this is very good. At least there's a clear objective that brings women's issues to the table. Uh, so when you look at the modalities on trading goods, you have a level of ambition of 90%. Uh, so where the least developing countries have a special and differential treatment in terms of longer transitional period entitled to a 10 year period for implementation of their concessions. Non-LDC members, which you have South Africa, Kenya, et cetera, will liberalize their 90% within five years. And the LDCs in terms of sensitive products have 13 years and 10 years for non-LDCs. Next please. Okay, uh, so basically uh, this flexibility is gradual liberalization transitional period is there that if used properly can also assist women. So for example, in terms of flexibility, the FCFTA negotiations that uh, allows um, that only 90% is liberalized, uh, there's flexibility, there's a gradual liberalization, for example, the 10 years, so even if you liberalize the year one, you have 10 years for LDCs and five years for non-LDCs. And doing this, we haven't followed up, but uh, women issues could be brought up on board uh, through this gradual liberalization to make sure that products of interest to small scale producers, majority of whom are women, uh, are taken on board to enhance their comp competitiveness in intra-Africa trade. And if properly harnessed, these measures will allow countries to protect their small scale producers, including women against competition. Next, please. Okay, so basically the focus, uh, and this will be for Trudy, Tralak and others, would be in the future when we negotiate is the composition of the 10% that is allowing for sensitive products to yield optimal space and support for vulnerable groups as well strategic sectors, because countries have to look at their strategic sectors. 
And we need actually to assess the offers that we have currently on the table to see what is their implication on gender. So maybe this is one of the recommendations that we need to assess this, to look at what products are within this 90% to assess their implications. Next, please. Am I doing it myself? Next. Okay, so I thought uh, of interest. Uh, you look at the product lipstick used mainly by women. You have sanitary pads, ladies, uh, cow dung. I don't know why that you can't trade, you can't carry cow dung, but perhaps that would be the cheapest if you could move it by lorries. Next, please. I thought I, we quickly scanned to look at. Uh, so if you look at ECOWAS, Egypt, Mauritius, category A, those products that I had mentioned are in category A. Let's go to the next. For example, lipstick, you have uh, Lady Sari. This is of more interest than lipstick. So you have Semak is category B, best rate is 20. Uh, the rest you have is category A. It's Sishas and Mauritius, as you can see, you have zero. So that's a potential market to export woven fabric and lady sari to Sishas and um, uh, Mauritius. Uh, you can see SEMA quite high there, 20 in category B. So maybe when there's bilaterals, could, this one is one of the products that is of interest to women could be moved to A. And this is going back to the assessment we were talking about that needs to be done to look at the current offers on the table. Uh, next, please. Yes, so when we look at, uh, for example, sanitary pads, this has nothing to do with trade, but we thought it was of interest. You can see SEMAC, the best rate is 30%. It's quite unacceptable looking at how many poor we have in our countries, they can't afford this. So maybe NGOs can, can come in. I know in some countries that there has been a um, sort of advocacy to have zero for these products where you have seizures again, Mauritius. Look at Egypt, textiles has 60%, um, Saviet, et cetera. So these are quite high. So this is one of the areas that uh, uh, NGOs could actually advocate around to say that uh, those products that are important, whether being traded or not traded, uh, should be in category A and the rate actually to be lower, even to go to zero, basically. Thank you, next. So, annexes on SPS, TBT, uh, these have transparency provisions, simplification, notification, uh, equivalency. These are very good. They have actually provisions on exchange of information. Uh, so, basically, when you talk about action oriented, this is where the NGOs and the rest of our partners can come in when they are uh, creating uh, programs is to look at these agreements and actually when they are doing training to look at uh, how they will impact women to make it least uh, trade distorting and harmonization helps that uh, there are similar rules that are taking place that when a, 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 somebody is exporting to ECOWAS, for example, the rules would be similar to ESC, et cetera. So this is positive. And the FCFTA actually takes into account this um, safeguards. If there's a sudden surge of imports, uh, then uh, you have the preferential safeguards coming in, there's anti-dumping. But we must say that only very few countries, South Africa, et cetera, that have trade remedies and Egypt, Morocco to a certain extent, so basically we need training in this area. We need uh, an training, not only training, um, setting up of these institutions. So basically these uh, measures will allow small scale uh, countries to protect their small scale producers against competition via such input surges and counterfeit, sorry, and counterfeit products. Next please. The rules of origin, so basically it allows, um, protects, is this, uh, rules of origin have been called a passport. So women participating in value chains would be able to produce goods and services with significant African content in terms of raw materials and value addition. And when you have the growth of middle class, uh, you actually, they, it, middle class demand high quality products in terms of food, textiles, apparel, et cetera. Uh, so this, uh, the question of SPS comes in a double-edged sword when the middle class uh, 
grows, they, they are actually looking for organic. It's an opportunity, but can also be a hindrance. And this is something we have to work on that make sure women know what are the rules applying. In terms of rules of origin, as I mentioned, the outstanding issues are uh, textiles, uh, automotive industry, uh, and tobacco, automotive sector. So basically, these are the outstanding issues plus um, the appendix on uh, uh, appendix four on rules of origin. Uh, women entrepreneurs will have the opportunity to meet the demands from the growing middle class, as I mentioned. This will lead to high, higher profitability, but they need to be trained. But definitely, this is this as the small scale women, but not uh, all the women, as we'll see later. Next, please. So actions to help women take advantage. Improving transparency uh, is important, but transparency is also covered in all these agreements. Actually, one of the objectives is transparency. Uh, we need programs to help women with business training, financing programs, and connecting women to supply networks. So basically, there's a mandate for FCFTA and partners for technical assistance and capacity building across, actually, the protocols, the annexes, there is provision for this technical assistance and capacity building. So this is where actually our partners can come in to design activities to help women take advantage, not only take advantage of awareness creation in these areas that you know these are the rules that apply. It's quite important. Uh, for example, Article 29 of the Rules of Origin talks about fairs and exhibitions. So programs here can be developed Intra-Africa trade fair, for example, NGOs could actually develop uh, programs uh, to assist women to take part in fairs and exhibitions to showcase their products for them to be able to take ad advantage of FCFTA. So this is one of the area uh, that uh, the NGOs can come in. As mentioned, uh, technic technical assistance and capacity building is cross-cutting and can be used to address gender issues. We must stress that trade agreements are gender neutral. It is in the implementation that you can take a gender lens and create programs to assist women. But that's not to say that in phase two issues, we should not have specific, not only objectives, but perhaps to have a SND, special and differential treatment to say women. And Demita talked about the uh, it, what was it, um, simplified trade regime that uh, we could have something like that to assist women, for example, take advantage of the FCFTA. I think, uh, do I have any other slide? I, we were told to stick to eight. Thank you so much, Trudy, over to you. Halima, thank you so much. Your presentation highlights not only the substantive issues that we're negotiating and how relevant they are for women traders and for women consumers, but also some of the practical implementation issues. And this is where the complementary initiatives and also the support programs are obviously really, really important. So while we're still negotiating, it's already important to start looking at these complementary and support initiatives. So thank you so much for highlighting those. We're going to come back to you to discuss these in more detail. It's now my pleasure to turn to Daphine Lekipaiko, who's a trade and services expert from the AFCFDA Secretariat. Daphine, we very much look forward to your presentation on trade and services. There are so many opportunities for women across the broad range of, of services sectors. So we look forward to your update and to discussing some of the opportunities that we will have as women under the AFCFDA trade and services regime. Thank you so much. Over to you. Um, thank you very much, Trudy, for that introduction. Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Greetings from Accra. As I've been introduced, my name is Daphne Lekipaika. I'm a junior trade and services expert at the AFCFTA Secretariat. And I wish to express my gratitude for being given this opportunity to, of course, be part of this esteemed panel um, full of amazing women who, of course, accomplished quite a lot in their respective fields. I'm definitely humbled by that fact. Um, as um, Madam Trudy has indicated, I will specifically be talking about um, the opportunities, the trading services negotiations that are happening under the AFCFTA will present or will be used as a catalyst to unlock the economic um, 
economic expansion of the African woman. Um, so um, just to build on what Dr. Halim and also Madam Demisa have stated, um, the conversation that we're having today is very critical and important. And as we always hear, or as is always had in during negotiator, negotiations, we understand that the people who will actually benefit or ben, um, enjoy the benefits of the free trade agreement, in particular the AFCFTA, are not necessarily the trade experts sitting um, in the room or even the different trade negotiators but it's actually the people who are in the ground. Um, so the local lady that you go buy your groceries from, um, your friend who has a fashion empire, um, your nurse, the nurses, the doctors, the engineers, the people in the tourism industry, for example, the people in the financial um, financial sector, for example, these are the people who will be benefiting or um, seizing the opportunities that are present in the AFCFTA. Therefore, keeping this in mind, we now need to assess the agreements and the protocols in light of this objective to ensure that the African person or the African woman is able to grow economically, um, while at the same time we are ensuring the development or the economic development of our respective member states. So um, I will proceed now swiftly and to now discuss my presentation on trade and services. Um, my colleague Marie has assisted in sharing the screen. Um, my presentation is being will be done in four key parts or three parts. The first part, I'll just give a brief background on um, how the trading services negotiations are being done under the AFCFT to perhaps highlight or el elucidate how this process will be is being done currently. And then secondly, I will now talk about the general benefits or the key opportunities that the AFCFT agreement and in particular the protocol on trading services um, provides for the African businesses and in particular, of course, the African woman. And then thirdly, I will discuss now the status and the progress of the negotiations, what has been done so far, and also reflect on perhaps what needs to be done. And as a final note, um, I will now, of, of course, round up now my... I will now round up my... Um, um, I think there's someone who's unmuted. Sorry. Please, colleagues, could you ensure that you are on mute so that we can hear Daphine? Thank you so much. All right. Um, thank you. I'm sorry for that. So as a final note, I will discuss now how women can now seize the opportunities and the benefits that I have highlighted. Um, I think we can now move to the next slide. So as has been indicated by um, Madam Debete and also Dr. Halima, the AFCFTA seeks to create a single continental market for goods, services, and facilitate movement of persons and investment across the African continent. And one of the specific objectives of the AFCFTA in general is the progressive liberalization of services that is reiterated under the Protocol on Trade and Services. Um, it envisions a liberalized African services market, which allows um, businesses from across the country to easily, uh, um, to easily operate across borders, my apologies on that. Um, so from the agreement, um, the AFCFTA procedure is a member state driven initiative, meaning that the specific commitments that we foresee, for example, in trading goods and we foresee in trading services will be um, done at the member state level. Um, they the AFCFTA protocol um, in services has adopted a hybrid approach. In first instance, we will have um, member states committing through the schedules of commitments, which specify the scope and depth of market opening that will provide, um, that will be provided in their commitments and the requirements regarding national treatment and any other additional commitments that could be made available. So in this instance, you will need to elucidate or highlight how you will be treating um, African foreign nationals vis-a-vis -vis how you treat your own local nationals when it comes to the specific sectors. So for example, when it comes to um, licenses in the insurance industry, um, will you require um, companies that are coming from the African continent to have the same, to have the same um, restrictions or to have the same, to, to need to, my apologies, that, um, to need to 
have the same licenses to pay the same taxes regime as your own national. So those are some of the considerations that are highlighted in the schedules of commitment. And now the other approach that is being done concurrently with the negotiations that are happening um, is the development of regulatory frameworks, which will elucidate the regulatory principles and defending market access and the national treatments in the respective sectors. So we will have regulatory frameworks that we cover all the priority sectors and also the additional sectors in the next round of negotiations. Moving on swiftly to the next slide. Um, so the member states of the African Union have decided to liberalize or to commence liberalization in five key sectors. That is business services. Examples of businesses and services in the continent are, for example, professional services, um, professional services, medical, nursing, um, architecture. Um, architecture, for example, is one under the professional services. For financial services, we include opening banks, opening microinsurance farms, life insurance farms as well. For tourism services, we're looking at tour guides, um, tour companies as well, um, which we see um, a lot of women participating in this sector. Um, we also see the hotel and food and accommodation industry part of this um, service. And then there is, of course, the communication service sphere. We see mobile telecommunication, fixed telecom, just to name a few. And then the other additional sectors now that will be liberalized in the second round of negotiations, which are critical for the African women or where we have seen a prevalence of um, women participating in our distribution services, um, in particular retail, of course, and wholesale sector. And then there's also um, education. Um, education services, and finally, health services, um, where now we see a lot of women participating in. Um, to the next slide. So my next slide now, I'll be talking about the general benefits that the AFCFTA presents. Um, so to start us off is the liberalization of services, of course, and the of services and goods to the consequent removal of tariff and non-tariff barriers and also the consequent removal of general barriers to trade when it comes to trade and services. Um, it is, of course, increasingly noticed that trade and services is playing an essential role in boosting the continent's economy by creating jobs and reducing poverty. And that, furthermore, there is increasing realization that trade and services um, can provide immense benefits to women in particular, such as increased participation in service export and improved mobility abroad, as well as greater access to energy, telecommunication, education, and health services, just the services that I mentioned earlier. And there is compelling evidence if you look at the um, the liberalization of the services, for example, that happened in, in Asia, that indicated that um, the liberalization of services boosted the participation of women in the export of services, such as in back office processing, contact centers, among other subsectors. Um, to continue, of course, the IFCFTA will also um, lower the time and expense of transacting across the continent and basically establishing businesses in the continent will become way easier. And also there is the facet of being, um, uh, it being easier to also integrate in not only global value chains, but specifically regional and continental value chains will be easier to join. Um, there's also the possibility of new market opportunities that the AFCFD presents. Currently we have 54 member states out of the 55 um, states have signed the AFCFTA agreement and 43 of them have ratified the protocol and in its annexures. Um, currently, the African market will project a GDP of 3.4 trillion and a population of 1.7 billion, which is a considerable market for any business in the continent. And then there's also an increase of investment in the region. The AFCFTA will also create a better regulatory environment, as it is common knowledge that um, we do have a lot of fragmentation, of course, when it comes to the regulatory frameworks across um, the continent. And the AFCFTA seeks to address at least to some extent this fragmentation, if it means maybe in one aspect, the harmonization of the laws. Um, for example, how we'll see it in the customs, um, has, as has been highlighted, in the custom border rules and also in dispute resolution mechanisms. And in other sectors is perhaps some sort of common rules that we foresee to have in sectors. Um, to, 
in the next slide, um, I've also highlighted other benefits. For example, there is the enabling environment for the sharing of information and best practices, which is critical for us because um, it is also um, very apparent that um, African states have different levels of um, development. There are least developed countries, there are developing countries at the same time. And there's quite a lot that we can learn from each other, even in the different subsectors. And in this way, we can increase our own comparative advantage. There is also the cooperation and coordination in the development of regional and continental value chains across the continent, which is one of the key which is one of the key um, objectives of the AACFT agreements. And um, another one is development of infrastructure, just to name a few, the opportunities for states also to diversify their goods and services. And also, excuse me, as a final note is um, the services or the liberalization that is happening in, in the protocol on trade and services will increase the level of employment, skill transfer, and equally inclusivity across the continent. Through the commitments that will be made under, for example, mode four, which covers the movement of natural persons across the continent. So moving on swiftly, as I had stated that one of the objectives of the agreement is the development of regional and continental value chains. And to just highlight, I will share this slide and um, they will just speak more on that to just speak um, very quickly is um, one of the advantages of, a region, of the regional value chains is reduced transaction costs specialization in certain um, activities, increased labor, labor productivity as um, farms are able to unlock and join higher, higher levels of production. There is an increase in, compa in comparative and competitive advantage as industries are able to specialize in particular skill sets that they have. And also RVCs will enable farms to get access to lower cost raw materials and remove imp impediments that are present in the inter-African farms. Um, so uh, keeping all of this in mind, what is the progress that we have achieved or when will this benefit then start? And that's a key question. So we have done quite a lot. And I, uh, Marie, could you um, just press? We have done quite a lot um, in terms of actualizing the objectives of the protocol and trading services. We have engaged in state and non-state um, state and non-state party meetings under the committee. We have done request and offer process, which is fairly at an advanced stage. We have so far we report that we have 46 initial and revised offers um, from both state and non-state parties that are still under consideration in the committee of trading services we have developed negotiating papers and um, we have also taken um, part in AFCFT institutional meetings at the council of ministers level and also the senior trade office the current deadline that we have is to finalize the negotiations of first round by June 2022, so this year. So hopefully we're looking to start the trading of the, um, the start of trading of trading services in particular, hopefully this year. Um, so my last slide now is to just bring everything that I've just talked about in focus. Then how can women um, in particular seize this opportunities? And the background of this is that although trading services can improve economic performance, as I've stated, increase jobs and promote new export opportunities, um, the statistics indicate that the share of women employment in services is in developing countries in particular remains highly concentrated in the low and mid loss occupations, implying that women have not been able to um, seize the same opportunities as their counterparts. Then keeping this in mind, then what can women do to leverage this opportunity? I think the first one is pretty obvious, um, opening up a business. Um, if, when I looked at the statistics, it shows that the percentage of um, farms with a majority female ownership in the world is currently at 13.2%, and I believe it will even be lower um, if we if, um, reflect on the statistics now. Meaning that, of course, we want to facilitate and aid and ease um, the trade of the existing businesses, the existing women-led businesses, but we also should foresee to assist new businesses that are coming up and also to encourage women to join and seize these opportunities in the various sexes, for example, and also in goods as well. And then the second one is the scaling up. As I've stated that um, 
the problem is that in most the data indicates that women are presenting low and middle um, skilled occupations or sectors, um, meaning that um, to unlock this benefit and, for example, to join even the regional um, value chains, we will need to scale up our own businesses, um, meaning that you have to try to open a business maybe in another country and see how you can increase employment, increase your capacity as a farm to be able to join in the regional and continental value chains. The other one is leveraging, um, sorry, e-commerce and digital solutions. And um, we all know that e-commerce and digital solutions do um, provide a lot of opportunities when it comes to scaling up your businesses. ICT is a great driver of new jobs. And even without affirmative action, the sector has reported great participation of women. And using digital solutions has always aided farms as you are able to unlock several opportunities that are still present in the continent. And then the fourth one is increasing their employee skills um, or even increasing your own capacity. Um, so, for example, if you want to open a business, an insurance business in, let's say, for example, Zimbabwe, or and you're from Uganda, and maybe the Zimbabwean qualifications of opening an insurance business, or even being a doctor is that you have attained the certain qualifications, meaning that if your country does not have the same qualification regime, or you're not required, you need to at least boost your capacity to be able to unlock or be able to take part in trading this other um, countries. And then as a last note is um, leveraging uh, business networks. Um, just as an example, this forum that we're having now, there's several other parallel forums that are also happening where we're having constructive discussions on what the AFCFTA can do for women or even what the AFCFTA generally can do for African business, not only multinationals, but also small scale enterprises. I would urge everyone to engage in those um, conversations, to read more on the policies that are coming out, to read more on the briefs that are coming out so that you can also prepare yourself um, not only mentally, financially as well, to be able to unlock this type of benefits. Um, and in a nutshell, that is my um, brief, if I may call it, presentation on how treating services can be used as a catalyst of economic empowerment for the African woman. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Daphine, for that very comprehensive discussion of trade and services. You've touched on so many important connections between the trade and services agenda and, for example, industrial development, highlighting the connections between trade and services and trade and goods. So very important also that services, the number of services that are on the priority list, are so important to facilitate cross-border trade. So in the broader discussion about trade facilitation, these are so important. The connection to the protocol on digital trade are so important for us to make to opportunities in e-commerce specifically, but also more broadly in digital trade for women need to be explored. We're going to come back to you with a number of questions. I see some coming through the chat room already. Thank you so much, Daphine. It's now my great pleasure to invite Marie Providence Mugangu, and she's also from the AFCFTA Secretariat, and she will provide us with an update on what has happened on the Trade and Gender Work Program. We all know, and we haven't spoken too much about this yet, the protocol on women and youth in trade that is to be negotiated, a dedicated legal instrument focusing specifically on trade and gender issues and youth issues. Marie Providence, it's a great pleasure to invite you to give us an update where we stand, how are the stakeholder um, consultations going, what are we learning from those consultations about women's economic empowerment opportunities in the AFCFTA. Thank you so much and over to you. Thank you so much, Trudy. And um, I'm happy to be here and to contribute to this very um, important conversation of, um, you know, uh, discussing ways of making sure that ways in which women can actually take advantage of opportunities offered by the AFCFTA. And as you rightly pointed out, um, a specific protocol on women and youth in trade uh, will be negotiated in the coming months. 
um, the, the basis of it was um, the commitment by um, heads of state and government, uh, the Assembly of Heads of State and Government of the African Union that committed to broaden inclusiveness in the operation of the AFCFTA. Uh, uh, by including, sorry, uh, by sub, by by um, coming uh, devising, sorry, interventions that would support young Africans, women, uh, small and medium-sized enterprises, as well as integrating informal cross-border tra traders into the formal economy by implementing the simplified trade regime. My uh, colleague Demita di discussed the simplified trade regime earlier. Um, in addition to that commitment, head of states have also decided to include the, pro the protocol on women and youth in trade within the scope of um, um, the AFCFTA agreement. Um, in, in translating these commitments, of course, um, made by, by you know, uh, African leaders, the heads of states and governments, the AFCFTA secretariat was collaborating with key partners and held uh, consultations, national consultations in, 20, in 26 countries, uh, cutting across different regional economic communities, and also um, carried out um, regional surveys including at the, at the intra-African trade fair, in order to clearly understand, to engage with women in trade, to not only understand um, the, the different constraints that they face when trading across borders, but also to understand their expectations of what the AFCFTA sh should do for them. Uh, the consultations are quite insightful um, in understanding what kind of constraints women have been facing. Um, it, it's been rich in information. So you have, um, women have pointed out that they have challenges, for instance, in accessing the the relevant information it, it just about the AFCFTA, understanding its mechanics, how it works, and how they can actually position themselves in a strategic way to leverage it, to leverage opportunities that the, 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 the you know the one market offers, and even generally information about the different requirements that they must comply with um, before they they qualify. Um, uh, you know, to to benefit from from the, the preferences under the AFCFTA. They also talked about challenges related to access to finance, um, not only to develop their businesses, but also to scale up. Um, there was also the issue um, of of um, you know different uh, different issues that they faced at border points, including um, sexual harassment. Um, you know, long delays, the lack of proper facilities, such as storage facilities to, to store their goods. Um, so that, that also gave us a really good idea of, of what it is that, of what it is we have to reflect on when developing the, the protocol on women and youth in trade. Um, so the Secretariat is now working um, towards um, launching the negotiations themselves, regional consult uh, stakeholders consultations will also be held in order to um, understand even further and bring and, and bring together all the all the key actors um, that that also work in in the space of women's economy women's economic empowerment to to reflect on key elements first of all that need to be included in the in the um, in in the protocol itself but also understand what can be legislated and what cannot be legislated because obviously what one thing we need to understand is that the the protocol is not a solution to all ills but it's it's an excellent solution it's an excellent starting point and I should perhaps I shouldn't even call it a starting point because as you've heard that um, my, my colleagues previously talk, uh, discuss, there are already special provisions uh, that have been made to make sure that women can leverage. What the AFCFTA protocol on women and youth in trade is just make sure that the, the actions are focused, that the issues are clearly understood, it can be and can be can be dealt with in a more focused and in a more um, you know in a, in a more uh, in a more efficient manner. Um, to enhance the capacity of women to trade. Um, so that's that's um, a, a little that I can say about the protocol. Of course, I'm open to questions. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marie Provedance. Before I let you go, we have a question about the surveys that have been conducted. Will these results be made public so that we have access to see what those specific challenges are? Is there a plan to, to make that information available? Yes, yes, that information will be made available. We are working currently towards um, developing a regional report that, that will consolidate um, all the key findings that um, we, we managed to, to gather during the national consultations and, of course, the, the, the survey and produce a, a regional report um, that we will be presenting at the Women in Trade Conference that we, we are planning very soon. Um, and, and that, of course, will also um, 
the, the report will, will allow, will guide, sorry, negotiators in understanding what are some of the key issues that they need to, to deal with, you know, especially when it comes to um, making sure that the, the AFC FTA becomes truly a catalyst for women's economic empowerment. Thank you so much. Colleagues, Treasure Mapanga from the AE Trade Group was to join us. Unfortunately, she's detained at a very important meeting, and I'm going to tell you about the meeting. It's a steering committee meeting for next year's Intra-Africa Trade Fair. So although she won't be able to join us, I would like us to follow the information that will be shortly available about the Intra-Africa Trade Fair which will take place next year in Cote d'Ivoire. And we hope to convene to meet there. So it's a pity Treasure can't join us right now, but I'm sure she will share information with us in due course. Your presentation, Marie, has been particularly important as a segue into a discussion about basic challenges that women entrepreneurs face. And so it's absolutely opportune for me to invite a woman entrepreneur a young woman entrepreneur working in the food industry to share with us some of her experiences, some of the challenges, but also expectations for what the AFCFTA could do to improve trade opportunities. Sipamanda Makele from Local Village Foods. Sipamanda, it's a great pleasure to join you here in, to listen to your experiences, but also to take advice from all the experience that you've gathered in terms of product development, process development, and also bringing new food products to the market, and what this could mean for opportunities under the AFC FDA. Great pleasure to welcome you to share your experiences with us. Sipamanda, I think you're on mute. Thanks for, for that, Trudy. Uh, but thank you for, for having me and uh, good evening from Johannesburg, South Africa. Um, so for us, we run a food startup based in Johannesburg. We work with farmers um, from various uh, regions um, on our continent. So sourcing various food uh, commodities that are indigenous, but also naturalized on the continent itself. So from grains to superfood powders, we then create uh, value added products, for instance, like pasta made with moringa to canned foods, uh, uh, varying to beverages and um, snack bars using these commodities. Um, and we locally produce these for the health conscious uh, consumer. I think for us, one of the things that we realized, I think we started the business, and, and this is something I think even this opportunity presents itself, that in Africa, we have not tapped into our natural resources sufficiently. So at a global banquet table, you don't see African um, foods or cuisine being easily available, but also known and, 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 and being there. So I think one of the opportunities this presents itself is for us to be able to leverage um, on, on, on some of these um, opportunities we see. One of the obvious ones right now where we see the war and we see a lot of countries hoarding and buying uh, grains and hoarding them and those grains becoming so expensive. Yet in Africa, we actually have grains that are indigenous to name a few like Fonio that we source from Benin um, and to sorghum grain that grows in Kenya in South Africa, Malawi and Zimbabwe and many other countries. So we have these products that we could subsidize our, uh, substitute our diets um, instead of relying on you know, some of these uh, sort of foods that are demanded in terms of globally. So that is an opportunity for us, I think we've seen um, as a business. The other thing that we, we, we're seeing is really the trend around consumers wanting products that are, have less carbon footprint. So if you can get a product closer, then the better. Instead of me sourcing a product from Peru, I can source that from Ghana or Cote d'Ivoire, um, make it a bit easier and cheaper, but also just less carbon footprint um, in, in that sense. So there's definitely an opportunity from there, from that point, because consumers are being very conscious and demanding the, these products that are locally made, if I, if I could say. The other thing I'm, I'm seeing is the, the, the rise of the Africa, uh, uh, proudly African uh, trend. So everybody these days is, you know, proudly Africa, I want a product that's pr proudly African. We see that in diaspora in the US and the UK as well, where people actually want these products. So I definitely think that there's an opportunity for collaboration um, as, a, as a people, as a continent, so that we could able to be able to produce the, these products, but also from a skill set where, where people are actually 
are able to value add products. People are actually starting to create their own chocolate. Back in those days, you know, you could just get uh, cocoa and send it to Switzerland from Ghana. But now entrepreneurs in Ghana are actually making lovely chocolate and it's, you know, at a global standard, which is really awesome. And it's something we weren't doing before. Um, and so definitely there's an opportunity for that in Africa for us as entrepreneurs to be able to, to, to leverage on that. The other thing I've seen is really around climate change. So back in those days, there are things you could be able to grow, but now it's becoming difficult to grow them. So it's easier to source from another uh, region or closer neighbor um, where you, know, you can still have a product and accessible um, and still have something instead of not having being, being able to not have the product or sourcing it from Europe uh, or South America. So I think definitely that those opportunities uh, are, are there and we could leverage um, uh, on those. But, you know, some of these opportunities, obviously there are uh, challenges that it presents and I've seen as we are trading. So I source from Nigeria, I source from Tanzania, I source from Benin um, in Malawi and, 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 and Zimbabwe as well, uh, some of these commodities. And there are challenges obviously when it comes to this. And, and most of it, you know, just sometimes the corrupt culture that we see um, from officials, but also from business people. So you have goods, yet people want you to, you know, pay a bribe to clear your, your goods. And so you see that culture, um, some of the challenges we've seen uh, trading. The other thing is, you know, having a policy that, and yet there is no investment or support from government. So here we are, we've signed but what infrastructure does government um, offer? What investments do they offer so that it's easier for us um, as businesses to be able to trade, um, especially in terms of being a startup, a small business? So, so, so those are the things I think um, that present themselves as, 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 um, as some challenges. But the other thing one of uh, fellow panelists mentioned is around standard. You know, the common language for trade is standard. And the difficulty is when you don't, so if I'm sourcing um, from Nigeria, and there's a certain standard that they have, and I must either meet that if I'm maybe selling in the market, but also bringing it into South Africa, it's a different standard. And so the farmer in, in, in Nigeria or the farmer in South Africa, it's sort, of, it's sort of difficult because we don't know what is, you know, maybe the most appropriate, or if we had one sort of standard, it would be a bit easier um, for us to trade. It tends to be really expensive for, for, for us as, as, as startups. So I definitely think there's uh, opportunities, but I think one of the greatest opportunities this presents just the diversity that Africa has, the ability to connect and um, to, to interact uh, and learn. I, I didn't know before I started this business um, that I could learn so much about different countries and cultures, um, not just where I grew up in, in, in South Africa. So I think definitely this um, after gives us an opportunity to actually collaborate and learn from each other and leverages, uh, leverage our skill set uh, as a people to be able to make Africa better by producing products that are, are, are relevant for, for the global market. And we are already starting to see that. So definitely this, this is an opportunity that we want to, 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 to tap into. Um, just a, a, an example uh, lately, I brought in um, uh, products from uh, Lagos. And I mean, my bill, usually, you know, some of the, 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 the rates, um, I saw a discount there. And, and for me, I think that that, ha that adds, you know, to, to, to the pricing and, and to my customer and what I can charge. So that helps in terms of from a, from a business point of view. Uh, for me, that makes sense if I can save. Uh, so definitely, uh, I see this as, as a great opportunity. Mindla, thank you so much for sharing your experience. And um, would you mind putting your company website in, in the chat room so we can have a look at the products that you're producing because you are innovating in terms of using, using indigenous ingredients as you've indicated in beverages and food products, um, nutritional snacks and so on, which are really impressive and very tasty. So thank you so much for doing that. Colleagues, this brings us to the end of the presentation. So we now have an opportunity for discussion. I've seen some questions coming through in the chat room, but I think our participants probably have a lot more on their, on their desks that they would like to, to discuss. Um, I see that some of our colleagues are raising hands. <clears throat> Excuse me, just to start off with, I've noted a question from Lufuno. She says, good day, my, my name is Lufuno. I would like to find out more about opportunities for mentoring women who are in consulting. I have over 10 years experience in government agency and so on. I will be joining a consulting organization. My email address is here. I would appreciate even opportunities to be mentored. So 
the capacity building technical assistance that we were talking about earlier, extremely important. Let's build our capacity together. Very good opportunities. Edida, it would have been helpful, and this relates to trade and services, to know what strategies have been used to include women in each of the five sectors highlighted. Um, if I could come back to you, Daphine, on that. So, colleagues, just let's take a look very quickly at the, at the polls that are coming onto the screen. Daphine, as you prepare your answer, um, please take a look at what Edida is asking us here. Thank you so, so much. Okay, um, thank you very much, Edita, for that question. Um, I think it's a very important question to look at, especially when it comes to implementing then the um, objectives or even implementing the commitments that we are having at this um, negotiations. I will just like to say that um, the protocol on trading services under the preamble and also under Article 272D, um, let me just share my screen real quickly to just show that. Uh, sorry for this. Yeah, um, as you can see under Article 20, um, 27 2D elucidates that all the negotiations that are happening in trading services and also stated in the preamble will be based on the increasing the inclusive, um, uh, sorry, in increasing inclusive trade in trading services. So how will we be able to um, ensure that our small, medium enterprises, companies, and also the African-led businesses are able to unlock. Um, when it comes to particular strategies, I for now, I don't think we're there yet. Um, but as currently, we're still doing negotiations um, when it comes to the commitments or the level of commitments that member states want to have. But we do foresee in the implementation stage and also in the development of the regulatory frameworks that such um, papers or such initiatives are definitely necessary when we're thinking of implementation. And as my colleague Marie has also stated, it is now under the protocol of women where now we will see specific um, provisions and specific action points or obligations to member states when it comes to ensuring that inclusivity or women are able to access this opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Daphine. We have a question here from Lolita and, and colleagues, Lolita lapel Fourchet was a volunteer at Trelac and she's published a number of papers on women in trade. They're available in the chat room. So do have a look at those. Lolita saying, thank you very much for the interesting presentations. I would like to know what efforts have been made or are envisaged to mitigate the impacts on women traders and consumers on the flexibilities mentioned by Halima. It seems to be a delicate balancing act for enabling women to benefit from the trade. Halima, could I ask you to respond to that question? Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for that interesting question. I will actually speak first generally. Uh, there are those uh, complementary measures that our strategic partner, Afrexim, uh, is working on. For example, the Pan-African payment system which will allow traders actually to pay in real time. It's like an m -Pesa kind of thing that uh, somebody pays from and the guarantor becomes the Afri Exim Bank. Instead of uh, paying by SWIFT, going through New York, et cetera, uh, they have started actually a pilot project in Wameu, Ume, Umeo. Marie Prudence, you are French speaking, you could pronounce for me better. And then you have the adjustment facility uh, where when countries lose, for example, so I'm talking generally about countries, uh, uh, there's this adjustment facilities when countries lose um, through, uh, when liberalizing, they could actually uh, get uh, funding, though it's not uh, a grant, but at concessional loan uh, to mitigate these uh, impacts. But this is Marie's actually question because the protocol on trade in women will have to come up with these solutions to make sure that uh, the advantages are taken, uh, the provisions are taken advantage of, for example. Uh, basically what we have done is we've created, we've designed the structure, but we haven't put in place the action plan to implement this. So this is coming. And as you say, it's a delicate balance. I think moving forward, working with um, 
Trudy in Tralak and the rest, I don't know whether Marie would like to compliment. Uh, basically, we, we have negotiated, we haven't started implementing uh, trade in goods. I should, you remember when I started, I talked about 29 countries are ready now to start trading based on the adopted modalities. We have 35 with EAC today qualifying, uh, those are six countries. So basically we have put in place, but countries have not started, state parties have not started trading. Once they start trading, we will, of course, we've talked about challenges and these challenges are from experiences gathered from Rex. Uh, we know that we are anticipating, so we will design programs to um, mitigate uh, the disadvantages. I don't know whether Marie has something to add to this. Thanks, Halima. Marie, over to you. Uh, thank you, Trudy. And that question is really interesting and very pertinent to the development of the protocol itself. It's, it's it's really important to understand, um, you know, what what needs. We need to be very prudent, first of all, in what we are including in in the Women in Trade Protocol. Because I must point out that the idea of having a specific Women in Trade chapter is not a new concept on the continent. You um, said several. Regional economic communities have implemented it. You have the ESC that has um, a specific chapter on women in its uh, in its agreement. You have Comesa. You even have SADEC that has a protocol on women. So um, the AFCFTS protocol on women in trade is actually quite um, um, in, is in a unique position because it gets to build upon what is already there to learn what has worked and what has not worked and to see what can be scaled up at the continental level what are some of the best practices that can be scaled up at the continental level and what are some of the provisions that can be put therein that can actually be implemented and and are enforceable so that's something that we will always keep in mind as well when um you know engaging on the women in trade protocol um but that, that's not to say that um the different initiatives that have already been put in place um within the framework of the afcfta already um are not able to assist dr alima talked about paps you also have the ntb's online um, reporting monitoring and, and and eliminating mechanism that allows um private sector to to report any any um uh, NTBs that are uh, encountered at border post and, and these NTBs are actually resolved um, within a reasonable time. There's already an institutional structure that has already been put in place to make sure that the follow-up is efficient and, and done in a very coherent manner and in a manner that actually helps the trader uh, move the goods uh, much easier. But this is a point that is, is well noted and of course will still have to be considered within the context of the protocol. Thank you. Thank you so much, Marie, for that. Demita, could I would you, like... Sorry, to... could I just one minute say something? Yes, please go yes, ahead. Uh, thank you. I just wanted also to, to point out that women are not a homogeneous group and that the implementation will affect them differently. We've seen Sipamandra here, very good at... Uh, you've already started training without the FCFTA being operational, so we congratulate you for that. I wanted to point out that uh, Marie mentioned the MTB, for example, mechanism. Uh, under this annex, Article 8 talks about the S composition national monitoring committees. So basically, this is where we have to make sure that women are at the table, whether because they will come with a different lens. So you take Article 8 of the MTB, and it Article 8F talks about providing clear guidelines to the business community for the resolution. So here, when we talk about clear guidelines, we have to make sure that we talk about also small scale women when we are developing these guidelines. This can be already an entry point to make sure that we look at this through gendered lens that uh, these guidelines also take into account um, women issues. And when you look at uh, SPS and uh, Supermandla talked about this, if you look at uh, Article 14, it talks about cooperation and technical assistance. It's talking about development of infrastructure, identification um, of SPS centers of excellence. So this question is that we have all this in place, but it is in the implementation. And as we always say, the proof of the pudding is in the eating. We have excellent uh, FCFT agreement, excellent uh, annexes. It is you who are out there and truly to do research 
So actually research-based, evidence-based to make sure that women are taking advantage. And we, when we are producing these guidelines that we make sure we invite everybody to the table to make sure that women issues are not, uh, th that they're mainstreamed. And if they're mainstreamed is not in a tokenist way that it is just broad and uh, not implementable. Thank you very much, Trudy. Thank you so much, Halima, for making that contribution. We have a question, Demeter, for you, and it comes from Nazia Ibrahim, and it says, what are some of the specific policies for women in cross-border trade, especially rural women around border towns? We look forward to your answer to that a very important practical question. I just check if Demeter is still with us. Halima I may come back to you for an answer to that question then. Let me check with her first a second. Check another question. Oh, uh, there's a question for you on cross border. She's coming in, Trudy. Thank you so much. Yeah, uh, hello, Trudy. Yeah, can I take the question again? Yes, can I take the question? Sure, Demeter, hello, Trudy. Let's, yes, let's quickly read it to you again. Nazi uh, is asking, think, what are uh, some of the specific I, uh, okay. policies okay. for women in cross-border trade, okay. especially uh -huh. rural women in around border towns? Mm -hmm. Okay, so uh, when it comes to uh, 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 cross-border trade, especially for uh, border communities uh, uh, living around the, uh, the, the, the borders, what we have taught is that it would be good to have an identification system. We can have a simple identification system uh, because for some of these uh, border communities, uh, you know, I, I saw something interesting in the uh, uh, in uh, between uh, Abidjan and the, uh, uh, Ghana. You have a community living in between the border posts. So it is, they are living in no man's land. So you cross the uh, Côte d'Ivoire border and then you are at uh, the, in between the Côte d'Ivoire side and the Ghana side, you, you, have, uh, you have a community there. And what the immigration officer told us is that sometimes when there's a, a woman probably with her chicken going across to go and sell, and you are asking her for identity for passport, she's at a loss because for all she she's just walking across, walking down the road to go and sell something. So we are thinking that an identification system would be very good, a simple way of capturing them. And this could start by having them form themselves into associations. And then uh, uh, we can figure out how they can uh, have an identification system so that when they want to cross to sell their goods, they just show this identification and it is enough uh, for them to cross, to go and sell their goods. And then if you go to what I said about, about simplified uh, trade regime, it could also, so you, you look at the kind of products, this kind of uh, uh, border trade, uh, uh, community they are interested in selling across the border and you ensure that these products are factored in into uh, uh, what will form the product list for the um, uh, 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 simplified uh, 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 trade. These are some of the things that uh, actually can be done. Mita, thank you so much. Could I ask you very briefly to mm -hmm. tell us a little bit more about the simplified trade regime? What okay. would make this gender responsive? Okay. Okay. So um, when we look at what we have now, there is no gender bias in there. You know, for what we have in Comesa, what we have in EHC, and what we have in all the other places, we discover that they are uh, that they are using some form of a simplified trade regime. It is same for everybody. Uh, for for uh, uh, no, there's no gender bias. And so uh, what we are thinking of doing to, to, to make it gender responsive is one, it's like what I have just said now. 
you look at the products that are of interest to women, to women as uh, producers, to women as traders, to women as employees, just look across products that, uh, and to women as consumers, you look at products that are of interest to women. Because to be able to, to operationalize a simplified trade regime, you need to agree on the products that will be traded. And so in compiling this list of products that will be traded, there should be that bias, looking at it from the perspective of the products that are really of interest to women in these four categories. That's one. Two, you, we would also look at the threshold. We are trying to propose a threshold of $5,000, which we would propose to the member states if they accept, right, in the, uh, when we present the draft documents to them. But in this product of uh, 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 below uh, $5,000, uh, because we want to uh, also put in some form of sanctions so that these provisions are not circumvented, so, but in putting that, uh, we wouldn't have those sanctions apply to certain products that are traded by women. So, because when I say sanctions, you know, if the, the threshold is $5,000 and you, you can cross 10 times, right? So it becomes $50,000 in a day. And then you know that something is not quite right. You know, something is happening. So in putting this the limit to the number of times you can cross with your goods, we can also make that gender resp uh, uh, responsive. We can allow the women with their basket of $500 worth of good to go as many times as they can. So we intend to give it a, a, a this kind of... A... The other side of the trade regime that we would make responsive to women needs because of the level of literacy when you basically consider literacy, it is different for men and women. And so we would have these documents in the local language of the border communities, because we believe that this is where most of these uh, women traders will be, a high percentage will be coming from. So we would make it uh, 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 in, a, in a language that uh, the women can understand. So you know, these you. are a few, yes, these are a few thoughts we are having around how to adapt it to, 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 to a, a bias uh, agenda. Yeah. Amita, thank you so much. Can I ask you, I'm sorry to press, no, but it would ahead, be so sorry. interesting to yes. hear when will we negotiate this particular SDR regime? Okay. So uh, I uh, internally, we are developing the, the, the document. Right. The, the next stage after we develop the document is that we will uh, uh, put it before the subcommittee on customs, uh, cooperation, trade, facilitation and transit and have them begin to debate it. And then we pass it to the institutional structure. So it will go to, after they have debated it, it will go to the last level to get to the Council of Ministers who will make a decision on the simplified trade regime. And so the first draft Will be tabled with before the subcommittee. It will actually be in their agenda in the meeting that they would have uh, uh, the end of uh, April, 25th to 27th April, the first draft, the first basic draft, so that we have as their input into this document. And then we revise it, and then we bring it back to them. And then uh, 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 hopefully they deliberate on it again, and then we can pass it to the next level of the structure. Jamita, thank you so much. That's very, very good news. We'll be watching closely for progress yeah. updates on that. Thank you so much for that. Mm -hmm. Colleagues, we are just about out of time and I'm not going to summarize the discussions, but a number of you have asked whether we will be sharing the presentations that you've had this afternoon. We certainly will be doing that. As I've also indicated, we are recording the session and we will share the recording with all of you. It just remains for me to invite Catherine Toure, the IDRC Regional Director for Eastern Southern Africa, to invite Catherine to make our closing remarks. Catherine, welcome, and we look forward to hear your remarks. Thank you so much, Trudy. Thank you, colleagues. What a good discussion we have had today. And I know it is just the beginning. 
The Africa Continental Free Trade Agreement is historic. We know it will promote regional integration, intra-African trade, and prosperity. But centering the realities and concerns of women will be paramount. As Halima explained, they are not a homogenous group. They do play a significant role in trade in Africa as producers and entrepreneurs. They constitute more than 70% of informal cross-border traders. Thus, thus, the success of the free trade area is contingent on leveraging women's full potential. Barriers that women face need to be examined and removed, as mentioned by today's panelists from the AFCFTA Secretariat. That's how the future free trade area will serve the people of the continent. Women need access to finance and market linkages. Discriminatory laws and social norms that work against them need to be revisited. In addition, women shoulder a disproportionate burden of unpaid care work, something we did not talk about yet today. And this unpaid care burden limits their ability to take advantage of emerging opportunities. At the International Development Research Center, or IDRC, we believe in the power of action research backed by contextually grounded data and evidence and embedded in a change process. Engaged action research can uncover who wins and loses from the new trade pact, inform gender responsive policies and actions, and help identify what works and what does not. IDRC supports local researchers and organizations to find practical long-term solutions to the socioeconomic and environmental challenges that their communities face. Gender equality and inclusion are at the heart of our strategy 2030 and the research we fund. Two years into the COVID-19 pandemic and its disproportionate impact on women makes this even more important. IDRC is pleased to support the action research coordinated by TRALAC that Trudy Hartzenberg mentioned in her opening remarks. Collaborators across the continent will help drive a gender responsive African continental free trade agreement. The hard work and today's conversation are the beginning of at least a two year journey. And we'll probably <laughs> <laughs> go have to go much beyond that. We truly hope that you present today and your colleagues will harness synergies with your own work for a linked up effort to make the free trade area work for women and girls. Thank you very much. And we have a lot of hard work ahead, us, ahead of us. Thank you so much, Catherine. And colleagues, just remains for me to again thank all of you for your participation. It's been an extremely interesting afternoon. We've learned a lot. This is an important journey that we're on collectively. We can make the AFCFDA work for women. And women to benefit from the AFCFDA requires a collective and a concerted effort. We're committed and we hope you will join us. And thank you so much to the AFCFTA Secretariat and to IDRC for supporting us. Thank you so much. We look forward to meeting you again soon. Bye-bye everyone. Bye-bye Trudy. Thank you so much everyone. Bye-bye. Thank you.